My name is Asa Grazioli Venier. I'm from Rome. I'm a venture capitalist and I live in Los Angeles. My name is Cinzia Zufana. I was born in Broni, Italy, and now I live in Los Angeles. My name is Stefania Spampinato and I was born in Catania. I grew up in a tiny city called Bel Paso and now I live in Los Angeles. Hi, my name is Elisa Sednawi. I am Italian, French, Egyptian. I was born in Italy and lived uh, most of my life until I was 18 years old in Italy. My father was a business consultant. My mother is the true disruptor. They discovered that she was very pretty and she was asked to become a model and leave her small town in Livorno and move to Japan. Her father basically disowned her and she said, that's it, I want to travel the world and see the world and learn languages and always taught me that knowledge is power. And I think she reads two books a week. The background of my family is uh, um, uh, small business owners. So I am the first in my family to have a university education. In Sicily, I grew up in a very conservative uh, environment. All my uncles and aunties are very jealous and possessive and so my mom kind of broke a barrier by letting me go to Milan when I was 18 to pursue a career in dancing which was like no you cannot sustain yourself you cannot pay rent or a mortgage by dancing. You know I had lived the first five years of my life in Egypt arrived in Milan initially lived there three years then moved to the countryside. One of the biggest lessons my mother kept saying to me was, Asa, you're always going to find people that are smarter than you, prettier than you, have more than you. And I think she did that to kind of position me to be okay with potential failure in my life. But to me, that actually drove me to focus on becoming irreplaceable and focusing on what kind of value I could bring to everyone that I worked with, whether it was personal or professional, and how I could make myself be the best version of myself. My parents uh, had a small business uh, that involved transportation, so they worked together. My mother was, uh, uh, in her generation, uh, somebody that, who was working uh, with my father out of the house, and that was very unusual. That was out of necessity that they had to do that. It's a very sweet story because my parents couldn't really afford to support me in dance lessons because it was very expensive and the costumes were very expensive. So I told my parents, I was like, Mom, I don't want to go dance anymore knowing that they couldn't afford it and I didn't want to be a burden on them. And uh, she actually went to the dance teacher and asked to make my costumes for the recital. And the teacher said yes. So my mom had never had no like experience sewing or anything they were horrible they were the ugliest costume but they kind of matched the other ones and thanks to her i was able to keep studying and keep doing the recitals and she got better and better to the point that she became the official seamstress of the school and she made all the costumes so when i was nine years old and i would travel to egypt to see my father my parents were separated and when I used to go, I used to have to go for two, three weeks because it wasn't, you know, such an easy trip to do. And I came back and the class had decided in, this, in its entirety not to speak with me. So I found myself at nine years old for, I can't remember even how long it lasted to come back to a class that wasn't speaking to me. But most importantly, with no teacher and no adult understanding or recognizing what was going on. That was the type of bullying that I experienced. I mean, I was different and there was no one to help deal with the situation, right? But that's violent, you know, you feel rejected when things like this happen. You know, I did years and years of therapy and self-work to deal with the rejection of not being, you know, of not being accepted for who I am. I didn't have much uh, growing up, right? Uh, so education was very valued in my family because it was a way out of uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, socio-economic uh, layer where we were living. I went to the University of Pavia and I got a degree in electrical engineering, which was uh, in the 70s a relatively unusual path, for, uh, certainly for uh, women. I worked at the University of Pavia for a few years but I uh, desired uh, more opportunities than uh, what I could find in uh, Pavia. Well, I was born in Rome, and for the first eight years of my life, no one knew that I had dyslexia. But this young 
blonde, excited, energetic girl just had some struggles here and there. And then my parents divorced when I was nine years old. My mother remarried to a Chinese American and we moved to New York. And one of the first private schools that interviewed me came down and told my mother, you know, your daughter is brilliant, but you know that she's severely dys dyslexic. And my mother was like, I knew she was smart. You know, we finally identified it. And so I was lucky enough to be educated in the States and I was given a tutor that after school every day, I would be plucked from school and taken to this tutor. And she was the one who would take my homework and together we would unpack the homework and all the problems that we were trying to solve and really rewire my brain in the way that I was thinking and, my, and practice sort of in the way that I was thinking. And I truly believe that 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 experience is the most formative experience for the way that I approach business in the world today. And at 16, I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to become a lawyer anymore. I want to become a dancer. She was like, wow, why? No, don't do that. But she supported me. And when I was 18, I moved to Milan and I did the performing arts school for three years. After the three years, I started working in Italian TV as a dancer. On a job, I met this dancer that was Sicilian, but lived in London. We became very good friends and he was the one that encouraged me to go to London for a week and try it out. Didn't speak a word of English. I went to my first audition and they were like, okay, profile. And I was like, <laughs> profile. And I was like, <laughs> and thank God with dance, they have to show you what you have to do. So I had time to then learn and practice English. So I started working very young. I started when I was 14 years old to do the first pictures as a model. I never really grew up dreaming of being a model or working in the entertainment business. But it happened. Uh, my mother was working in the fashion industry as well, and I needed to be independent economically young at an early age. Modeling was a great opportunity to do that while I was traveling, while I was learning to adapt to many different work environments and also different people. But I never found in it, you know, the satisfaction and the passion that would really drive me to dedicate my professional life to this. And growing up, I think I was always looking for a sense of purpose and a sense that if I was gonna dedicate myself to something and, you know, when you're a mother like I am and a wife, you know, everything that brings you away from family needs to be somehow, I don't want to say justified, but, you know, you need to know why you're doing it, right? And so I eventually left Italy and uh, moved to the United States. I worked uh, first uh, in a consulting company doing work for the Department of Defense. And later on, I joined the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I was asked to be an editor for a documentary film in London. And uh, that's the career I thought I was going to have, telling stories about the world and history and how history repeats itself and pulling stories together. and. And then one pre-Christmas afternoon on the 18th of December, I was riding a scooter, a uh, motorino in, in London, and I was unfortunately hit by a taxi. Spent a year in the hospital, and when I came back to London looking for a job, luckily a friend of mine, Damien Mould, who ran an agency at the time, identified something in me, possibly a little bit of pity of this young, hungry girl wanting to, to find her way in the world. And he offered me a seat at his table. And the first thing that he brought to my table was a client, Vodafone, who was experimenting with uh, made-for-mobile programming. I got my visa, I moved to LA, but I hated it. I hated Los Angeles. It was so hard. And I felt like I had to start from zero at 29 with a career that I had been pursuing for 10 years. I struggled. I didn't know what to do. I didn't really, I was falling out of love with dance. I felt like it wasn't fulfilling anymore. I actually went to an open acting class to support a friend and watch one of uh, his scenes. And it hit me. I was like, okay, this is it. This is what I want to do. It felt like a very organic next step from being a dancer. Eight years ago, I was in Egypt. I was uh, actually shooting a documentary as a, my first documentary as a director. And I found myself in a school. I really saw at that point this very clear image. On one side, children that were thirsty for learning more 
and that were there because they wanted to learn more. And in front of them, teachers who equally were really passionate about delivering this information, about educating the next generation. What was missing was methods, was missing the systemization of methodologies to really create transformative group experiences, to really not only teach knowledge, but also teach social emotional dynamics and social emotional skills. I was often the only woman in a group of men at work. And so in my case, in particular, once I left Italy, I was uh, uh, also an immigrant woman, right? So somebody speaking with an accent in a group of men, not knowing often the context. So I had to learn these things uh, as I went along. It, it was definitely a journey of discovery as I was uh, leaving the journey. And then Ministry of Sound on mobile we created. And of course it's a good European, a good Italian. I love dance music and I was thrilled to create video content around a dance music uh, brand that I had known all my life. And then the president of Ministry of Sound said, who's Who's producing those videos? Who's doing Ministry of Sound on mobile? They said, oh, some girl straight out of college, you know, ex-editor, and uh, you should meet her. So I walk into his office. He showed me around the office, showed me what he had in assets, the record label, the radio channel on Sky. And he said, what should I do with my business? And I was 23 years old. And I said, why don't you have a website with content on it so I can listen to the music and w see the interviews of your DJs? And, and why can't I buy the products that they're talking about? And so uh, he said, well, you're hired. And so he hired me then and there. And he said, uh, you're now head of TV and radio. Starting a new career as a foreign actress in Los Angeles is so hard and telling your parents, um, I'm going to start acting. They're like, what at 30? Why? And I'm waiting tables in the meanwhile. And it's just your ego is crushed. Like you're literally stepping on your ego over and over again. Fantasia effectively today is a benefit corporation. So it's a company that creates educational program and through the nonprofit arm in Egypt, Italy, Mexico and the United States, States from this year as well, uh, brings this methodology to communities that cannot afford it, so underprivileged communities. You know, now fast forward eight years, you know, I'm a mother, I have two kids and they go to school in Los Angeles and they are privileged enough to have had the opportunities to go to very good schools. But what I've noticed is that even in those great schools, teachers are not prepared to really take care also of the social emotional well-being of children. I mean conflict management, deep listening, building of confidence, following instructions and giving instructions. They seem very simple things that for us are given, but those are the skills that we need to realize ourselves as humans. So it has always been a, a dream of mine to work in an environment where big things are happening. I mean, the outcome of efforts are outcomes that go beyond an individual. And so definitely the environment of NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory provided me with those ingredients to uh, reach my professional fulfillment and feel that uh, I could give my best. Uh, and at the end of the day, I feel that uh, I have made some contributions that uh, uh, hopefully are helpful for society at large. The real change happened when I met Daniel Ek at a conference in Monaco where I was speaking and he was sitting on a sofa with his advisors. I already knew what Spotify was. I had heard about this streaming service that gave you all the music when you wanted, how you wanted it, at the touch of a button. And to me, that gave me goosebumps. And I thought, what is this? You know, I'm a, I'm a music fiend. And so I went up to him and uh, as a good Italian, I said, I'll launch you in Italy. And he looked at me and said, eh, I think we have bigger markets to, to, to look for. And I said, I'll launch you in the UK. 
And uh, a few months later, we, we reconnected. Long story short, I ended up working for Spotify for seven years, working on special projects and launching things like uh, artist services division in the UK and supporting that in the US. And that's really when I realized that my network and my understanding of consumer and my understanding of the creation of value and trying my passion for wanting something like Spotify to be in the hands of more people and more consumers drove me to, to tie my network, my understanding of deal making and to help the company thrive and expand across different markets. And it culminated to me moving to LA five years ago to launch their LA office. Because I was getting so many audition and so far and few in between, I was so nervous when I was in the room. I was auditioning for an Italian speaking role and I couldn't say the word because I was so nervous. Like my lip was shivering so hard that I couldn't even say what I was supposed to say. The accent already limits you immensely because there's only probably, I don't know, maybe one audition every couple of months for Italian roles. When they want an Italian actress, they also open the audition to the Spanish, the French, the Colombian, the, 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 the Brazilian. For them, an accent is an accent. It doesn't necessarily have to be an Italian accent, an authentic Italian accent. So you get one audition every two months and the whole foreign community auditions for it. The first step was to start writing down what was in my mind, to realize the vision that I had for a more progressive education that would really build a bridge between education, curriculum drafting experts, you know, PhDs that work in education and professionals out there. Not only we teach those life skills, but we use those tools like art, photography, directing, gardening, nutrition, coding to teach those skills experientially. I joined the board of directors of Juventus nine years ago and I actually met Andrea Agnelli on a train. He called me one day when I was in New York and asked me if I would join the board of directors and help him take the old lady and make her into a young lady, into a young new technological future. And I couldn't but say yes. Three years ago, we launched Juventus Women. This was the first real significant women's team in Serie A. After seeing the boom of the Women's World Cup and really being proven that there is not only attention but demand for more women in sports, I realized that it was inevitable that I was going to want to enter the space. And so when I was called one day by Steve Baldwin, who's the owner of Washington Spirit, which is the women's soccer team in Washington, D.C., and he was pulling together a new ownership team, it was virtually impossible to say no. It is, of course, an honor to be alongside Chelsea Clinton and Jenna Bush and Dominic Dawes, who is the Olympic world medalist. Here is a city at the center of the world, center of politics, with an existing team of women on the field playing all over the world. I knew that I had to not only invest, because I see it as a financial opportunity long term, but also I wanted to take all of my experience to be able to help teams in this country and the league in this country grow. I definitely remember my first day at JPL, NASA, uh, because it was raining in Southern California. And, and that is in itself an unusual event. I was about 35 when I started. My background is that of a mathematical modeler, in particular is the modeling of propagation signals. So how electromagnetic signals propagate through the atmosphere of our planet or other planets. I am actually an Earth scientist. I, um, I work uh, and I'm interested in our own planet. And so my own work has been in uh, remote sensing of the Earth. We have a satellite that looks at the Earth uh, from afar. What I've been studying in the last uh, several years is uh, um, how do we measure the extent of the uh, surface waters, so the wetlands, the distribution of water on, on the land and how they change. They also are responsible for the production of methane. And methane is uh, a powerful greenhouse gas. 
So the increase in the production of methane is of concern because uh, it contributes to global warming. So having a knowledge of what is going on globally uh, on wetlands is, is very important. I thought about giving up every other week, pretty much. Somehow though, every time I was right about to give up, something would happen that just gave me the strength to keep going a little longer. I don't know why, but it happened like when I truly was ready, because a lot of times you're like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore, I give up. But when I was truly so crushed that I was like, okay, this is it, I can't do this anymore, something would happen, like a, a, a small job or like an email from an agent or an email from a casting director that would just give you hope and refill the energy tank and give you the strength to keep going for a little longer. With my family, it was really hard because my whole family is in Sicily. So it was very hard to explain to them uh, I'm getting all these rejections, but I'm gonna keep going. They kept saying like, why don't, you're smart. You, you can do other things. Why don't you just do something else? Why do you have to wait tables and uh, 35, 34 while waiting for a big break that usually doesn't come? And so after a while, I stopped telling them that I was even auditioning for projects because telling them about my rejection was so painful. I felt like I, I was suffering for the rejection, but also suffering with them because of their pain and their disappointment for my non-successful journey. So I was like, I think I need to stop telling them and deal with it by myself. I started this project without knowing that I was going to really dedicate myself full time to it, which I am today. And when I started, you know, it was a moment where my career in the acting and in the modeling was picking up. So a lot of people didn't understand and they wouldn't understand why someone who had a career starting in fashion and, and cinema would decide to, to do social development. It just didn't make sense to them. And for me, when I find myself with teachers in, in Italy, in Egypt, in Mexico, or when I see children that for the first time are asked what they think and look around them saying, is this real? Am, am I being asked what my opinion is? That moment of recognition that you see me, I see you, and we're in this together is of a power that it's in no way comparable with being a model or an actor. I met my husband uh, uh, right at Caltech. Bruce uh, and I were working in the same building, completely different groups, but uh, we had, uh, we crossed paths. Uh, Bruce was, um, was a great friend since the very beginning. Uh, Bruce is from Australia, so we were both uh, foreigners in, uh, in the US in a place like Caltech. And so he gave me yet another perspective. The garden is, uh, is important because uh, it's a project. Uh, we, um, when we bought the house, uh, the garden wasn't like this. And so uh, the house was disappointing to me. That was the time when coming from Italy, I really was looking for a different environment, right? And so, but that presented me with the opportunity. And I come from, a small place and I grew up in a huge garden because uh, we had vineyards. It was uh, a way for us to build our life together around the planning and then the implementation, um, the design of the elements. Uh, we have a fish pond which uh, we designed and so it, it, it's really the, our way of uh, creating. On the Wednesday night I'm crying in acting class because of my accent and because of how limiting it is because of, I just only get a very small role like auditions for very small roles I'm like I am this is exhausting I again I was like I'm quitting I'm on the verge of quitting that night I get an, uh, an email from the manager that tells me we have an audition for you it's a role for Grey's Anatomy it's a guest star role maybe one two episodes and they want an actress that speaks fluent Italian so I go to the audition the morning after and because I was so exhausted, I was like, you know, I'm just gonna go and have fun. And the casting director was like, what? Like, let's do the scene. And slowly they warmed up to me. And two hours later, I get a phone call from my manager saying that I had booked a job. 
and I literally screamed so loud that the neighbor texted me if everything was okay because she thought somebody's killing her or kidnapped her or whatever. When I arrived in LA five years ago, Rachel, my now business partner, entered the office and pitched me a business that Spotify should have partnered with. And over the course of the year, we worked side by side and made this deal happen for both of our businesses. And then just as we were announcing that deal, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and had to have within two weeks a double mastectomy. So I took a few months to recover through the post-cancer treatment. And throughout the three months of recovery, Rachel, who would come and visit me every day, she and I would sit and think about our future. And Rachel and I built Muse Capital off my bedside during the recovery of breast cancer and a double mastectomy. Well, the hardest thing is that the first person I wanted to call would have been my mom. But I lost my mom two years before. Once you experience something, like a loss that big, nothing is that important. Like not booking a job doesn't become that important, but booking it and not being able to share that with her was very hard. My mom was my biggest supporter. My mom was the reason, like the number one reason why I was even able to go to London, go to Los Angeles. And she gave me the freedom and the strength. Like while I was doing my performing art college, I had to work in a pub every night to be able to support myself and to pay for my studies. But my mom gave me the freedom she never had. The global pandemic has shown us and really a stark reality of all the problems that the world has had. My problem is that if capital is being managed by only one type of person, then it's going to be directed into only one type of company. But the minute that you open up the world to a diverse management of capital and why it's so important to have more women and diverse people holding the power of capital, that capital is going to be transformed into businesses that are reflective of the world today and of the needs of the world today. The issue with women and the image of how it's been presented is not only related, of course, to body image or body shaming and, and, and the, the necessity that we have now to really be more comprehensive in the different type of role models that we bring forth, but I think it's also broader than that. I mean, I would really like to see, you know, and hear about stories of many more type of women out there. You know, I mean, I'd like on the cover of magazines, not just actors or celebrities or influencers or musicians. I'd love to hear about women that are mothers that are really working really hard to get this amazing product out there. And that would in turn inspire so many other women. Muse Capital invests in underserved markets, which inherently are wide open markets ready for innovation and disruption. And particularly the areas that we invest in are future of motherhood, future of parenting, telehealth, education, fintech, and media and entertainment. And now we are amassing 33 startups so far that we've invested in, and all together they are growing in value above $1.5 billion. We invest in companies with teams that we know are going to be able to execute on these wild dreams and ambitious dreams. And those teams that do best are the diverse teams. Not just diversity in gender or race, but diversity in the way of thinking and approach and experience, or what I call gathering years. You know, the, the years before that got you to this place, the kind of experiences that we've had. The night before going on set for the first time, I was terrified. And the first scene that I shot was with a woman director, Debbie Allen, which is a very strong woman. I was very lucky because in the scene there was a lot of Italian and nobody else apart from me and the, the actor who plays my brother spoke Italian. So I was like, ha, I can do and say whatever I want and nobody's gonna, and that made me very comfortable because I felt like I had a point of advantage compared to everybody else. And I was like, okay, I can anchor myself on this Italian thing and then go and do the rest. So that really helped. What I've learned and what I'm really trying to harness in the last years is 
anything from learning how to deal with our own monthly cycle and the fact that we do have months when we're bleeding that affect us, affect our mood, affect our physical performance, affect a lot of things. And if instead of wanting to be like men, we learn to harness this power and really celebrate who we are, not only we would be happier, but the contribution in the world would be much more powerful. Women shifting from being object to being subject is a very tough shift to make and it's all up to us unfortunately we have to change people's mind and sometimes as women i feel like we have to work five times as hard to achieve the same thing that a man can achieve very easily choosing what we watch who we follow how we portray ourselves on social media is fundamental because there is very good stuff out there that has been directed and written and starred by women. So let's start investing time and energy in that. Companies with female founders perform 63% better than companies that are all male founders. This is all real statistics. And one of the reasons that we invest in underserved markets like women's health or telehealth is because women represent 85% of the decision-making power in a household. That is huge. The millennial mother today has never been spoken to before because the millennial mother today is very different than the mother before. She's a much more dynamic woman because she's been given all these opportunities. I was brought up by parents that made me feel equal. That's for sure. I never felt with my father, you know, or, or with my family, this feeling that because I was a woman, I would not be able to do certain things, right? Never. For the first part of my time in Los Angeles, my friends were mostly American. And then I met my first Italian friend that is in the entertainment industry. And then through him, I met more and more people. And in the last couple of years, I feel like I've met a lot. I didn't even know how many Italians were in Los Angeles until a couple of years ago. And it, it was such a great discovery because it's hard for all of us. So having a, a support group of people that know it, exactly what it feels like to be so far from home it makes you feel like a home away from home instantly what do i miss of italy i miss everything i miss my family i miss of course going to the juventus stadium and feeling the vibration of that stadium and the energy that that really there's just nothing like what a sports in a stadium can do for you and for for, for the heartbeat it really is extraordinary and i miss the food I miss food, I miss flavors, I miss culture, creativity. I have always felt very connected and proud of being Italian. What I love about Italy is the quality of life and the love of life. And, you know, there is something very, very unique about our culture and even just our use of language and humor. That is something that is untranslatable. The way we play with language and, and words and little subtleties of things, I find is very special. What I did not expect when I moved to Los Angeles is that I was gonna meet a lot of Italians here and that we were gonna make a, such a tight group. And we love our moments, you know, just going for lunch or going for dinner or calling each other. I love this feeling of celebrating our culture, of being who we are with our strong identity. Uh, I miss the people, for sure, and I miss certain places because I, I had no memories. It takes a while for memories to develop. And memories involve uh, people and places. And then uh, as time goes by and I have morphed, I'm no longer the person I used to be uh, and my identity has changed a little bit, there are different things that uh, come back to me that I miss from Italy. Almost I would like to be able to move quickly in space to be able to live uh, both here and there. Right? And perhaps in my lifetime we will have that kind of transportation. I think, you know, how to realize your dream is a mixture of really hearing yourself, knowing yourself, expressing yourself clearly. My dream is now for the things that I've built to consolidate, you know, the professionally, the social enterprise, the non-profits to be able to benefit as many people as possible, potentially to go to more countries. But for me, just the ability to be in the present, enjoy the moment for what it is, not worry too much about what will come, be present with my children, my husband, my friends, with myself.
My dream is to, uh, um, to really put in place uh, a stronger relationship between uh, uh, Italy and North America. Italians, Italian universities, uh, Italian academics, Italian industry, foundations to work together uh, to increase the opportunities for Italian talent to, uh, uh, to be appreciated, to be successful, and Italian people to succeed. So I say that I'm building my El Cassetto, El Mio Cassetto dei Sogni, I'm building it. And I'm just starting to put dreams in there and I hope it keeps going. What's my dream? Well, I always say you have to put your oxygen mask on before you can help others. And so my dream is to continue to build Muse Capital into one of the premier investment funds in the world, investing across technology and consumer and continue to do what we do at the best of our abilities and grow our team. That inherently will mean that we will be putting capital into diverse managers and extraordinary humans doing, building important things that are changing the world. My dream is to teach the everyday woman who's an artist or an athlete or anyone that it is absolutely her right and ability to understand equities and investment and to grow their financial worth and to be able to then take that capital and reinvest it into making the world a better place. <laughs>